الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه البر الميامين وعلى من تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين Today, inshallah, I will continue to teach some Arabic grammar. I will use uh, some more verses of the Quran to explain Arabic uh, grammar and Arabic meanings. thinking of Allah. Do the first few verses of Surah Al-Kahf, Surah 18. To demonstrate Arabic uh, grammar and meanings. Bismillah rahman rahim الحمد لله الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا الحمد لله just like in الفاتحة الحمد is praise praise out of thanks and, and praise because the person you are praising deserves the praise for their, for what they do, and for the, for their attributes. Uh, Surah eighteen, Al Kahf. So Alhamdu. Alif Lam Al is a definite article. Alif Lam Al Tarif. Al Tarif means definition. So we are expressing, in this case, Alif Lam has different functions. The definite article has different functions. In this case, it is uh, exclusivity. All the praise. It's like saying all the praise. And then, so this is the subject. This is in Arabic called mubtada. This is mubtada, the subject. And then we have some information about the subject in the following words. The subject, al Muqtada, al Muqtada, is followed by khabar, which is news or information. And when a sentence is structured like this, with Muqtada, which is a noun, and the khabar, which could be a noun, like when we say al-qamaru jamilun, the moon is pretty. One noun and then another noun, al-qamar, the moon, jamil, is also a noun grammatically. You might say it's an adjective because uh, something is beautiful is like as an attribute. But in grammar, it is, it is a noun. Al-Qamaru, Jamilun, they're both nouns. And the first one is Mubtada, and the second one is Khabar. In English, they say subject and predicate. Subject is the Mubtada, and the predicate is Khabar, the news, the information about it. Here, Alhamdu is Mubtada, is a subject, and the predicate 
starts with lillahi, with a prepositional phrase. Lam, li, has many meanings in the Quran. And it's not always a preposition. It, sometimes it uh, affects a verb. It's an article that affects verbs too. So here, lillahi, to God, or for God, expresses exclusive belonging. So all praise belongs to God alone. So lamb there, the lamb, the li, means belongs alone. And we have alhamdu meaning not just the praise, but all the praise. That's the meaning included in Alhamdu. Because of Alif Lam, the meaning is not just the praise, it's all the praise. So all credit, all praise, all uh, attribution of, of beauty and perfection and actions, everything in the universe is done by Allah. And to him alone, to him alone belongs the credit and the praise. And then we have Alladhi, Alhamdulillahi, Alladhi. Alladhi is a relative pronoun. In Arabic it's called Ism Mawsul. It's a noun, a pro noun that represents a noun. That's what pronoun means. It's a noun, an article, or something that represents a noun. Alladhi means the one who. The one who is here, its grammatical state, its grammatical role, role is, is a good word to use in grammar because the components of a, of a sentence, they play roles. The role that a levy plays is badal, substitute. All praise to Allah who is the one. So, alladhi is majroor, has, is in the genitive case, or in the dative case, there are different grammatical terms for something that is affected by a preposition, especially the preposition to, can also be called dative. Allahi, lillahi, Allahi there is in the dative case, it's in the genitive, it's majroor. Majroor means it has kasra on it, or a different indication that it is pulled down. Majroor means pulled down, so the kasra is, is, expresses down in Arabic in the Arabic grammar, whereas fatha means like up. So they say the a uh is mansub, raised up, whereas when there is a kasra on it, they say majroor, it's like pulled down. So lillahi, the word Allah, has a kasra at the end, Allah he, Allah he. And alladhi is also majroor, because it's a substitute of Allahi. So all praise belongs to God, who is also, who is 
Alladhi, who is the one, a, pro, a relative pronoun uh, like Alladhi has a sentence associated with it. It's what that reference does, or what is attributed to it. In this case, it's أَنزَلَ عَلَىٰ عَبْدِهِ الْكِتَابَ وَلَمْ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ عِوَجًا And it continues. So everything that follows is what that one who substitutes Allah or like saying Allah who also is the one who All praise belongs to Allah alone, who also is the one who has sent down Anzala. Anzala means sent down. Nazala means come down. Nazala, come down. Anzala is to cause to come down, to bring down, to send down. The Hamza, the A, uh, when it's added to the root, to the tri-consonant or tri-letter root, it, one of the meanings is to cause to. So Nazala is come down, Anzala is to cause to come down. Ala Abdihi. Ala Abdi is jar wa majroor. One way to express the preposition, the preposition is called harf jar in Arabic, but it's also called jar. Jar. Jarun wa majroorun. Ala abdi is jarun wa majroorun. Abdi is majroor, is in the genitive or in the dative case, and we have the kasra on abdi, that indicates the genitive. It's a, another prepositional clause, prepositional phrase. Now, anzala is the beginning of jumla fi'liya. Alhamdu lillahi etc., is jumla ismiya, is a sentence composed of nouns. First noun is called mubtada, or subject, and the second noun is called khabar, or predicate. The sentence that is attached to the pronoun alladhi, to the relative pronoun alladhi, starts with a verb, anzala. So it's called jumla fi'liya a sentence with a verb, or a verbal sentence. Anzala, the verb. A verb requires a subject, requires an actor, the one who does the verb. Now, when we have a pronoun, the pronoun Alladhi is the preceding a verb. It is the, the one who is doing the action. That's the way uh, relative pronouns and their sentences are structured. So anzala is the verb, and the actor, the subject of that verb, is not mentioned, but it is implied. This is how grammarians express it. They say it's, it's not there, but what is implied is that it is something that refers to Allah. Ultimately, it refers to Allah in Lillahi. So he's the one who Anzala. He is the subject of Anzala. He's the one who did Anzala. And then we have ala abdi. 
that prepositional clause is associated with Anzala. The bringing down happened on a servant, Abd. An Abdi, he, that structure is called Mudaf and Mudaf Ilay. Abdi is Mudaf and the he is Mudaf Ilay. And that means servant of him. When we have something of something, the first part is called Mudaf and the second part is Mudaf Ilay. Mudaf means associated with or belongs to. So Abdi belongs to and he is al mudaf ilayh the person or the, the thing that the first part belongs to servant of him that's mudaf and mudaf ilayh al kitab that is mansub it has a fatha on it. Al-Kitab, the book. Why is it mansub? Why does it have a fatha? It's because it's in what they call the accusative case. The objective case. It is the object of the verb. It's the target of the verb. It is what is affected by the verb. The actor in Arabic called al-fa'il al-fa'il of the verb anzala, the one who is doing the anzala is al which refers to Allah. It's implied and it is al it refers to al and al is a badal from Allah. So Allah is the one who anzala but what did he answer? What did he bring down? It's the book. So the book, Al-Kitab, is the object of the verb. So this is one sentence that is associated with al -Ladi. All praise belongs to Allah alone, who is also the one who has sent down upon his servant the book. The book is, of course, the Qur'an. Wa. Wa means and. In Arabic it is called harf, atuf. Atuf means conjunction, bringing two things together, joining two things together. Conjunction, junction is like joined at the same stem as the word join, junction, conjunction, joining. So there's another sentence that is associated with al and it starts with lam. Lam is a negation article. Yaj'al. Yaj'al is a verb. Ja'ala yaj'alu. Ja'ala is um, loosely translated to make, but what it really means is to cause something to happen or to convert something into something. When we have two things, it's the conversion, but here we have one thing. He did not do jal, he did not cause to happen for it, la hu, to it or for it, to the book, iwaja, iwajan, it's in um, accusative in the objective case with the fatha, 
a double fatha or fatha and noon, ten ween, iwa jan. Fatha and noon is called ten ween. And ten ween nasub. Nasub because it's mansub. It's associated with fatha. He didn't cause for it any crookedness. Lem negates something happening in the perfect tense, in the past, in the future, ever. Lem means never. So he never caused any crookedness to it, to the book. What does that mean? It means that Allah has made it so that there can be no crookedness logically associated with the Quran. Now you can associate with the Quran crookedness, but it won't stand the test of logic or the test of rationality. First, the letter of the Qur'an, the writing, the words of the Qur'an have been preserved by millions of ear witnesses, direct ear witnesses, who heard it from the, from the Prophet wasallam, And the Prophet had the Qur'an reviewed twice in the last year of his life with the angel Jibreel alayhi salam, the archangel, archangel Gabriel. So the Quran, the whole Quran was reviewed by the archangel Gabriel. And the prophet reviewed it then with those who listened to it and they memorized it word for word. And then others memorized that word for word from them and they learned how to say it. The purpose of memorizing the Quran is to, there's only one purpose of memorizing the Quran, and that is to preserve it, to have ear witnesses, to continue to have ear witnesses. If you go to court and, and the judge asks, where's the evidence? The judge wants testimony. And those who memorize the Qur'an are witnesses who give testimony. They have heard the Qur'an from someone who has heard it from someone who has heard it from someone who has heard it from the Prophet ﷺ. And this is not hearsay because the process of memorization has led in the end to a single version of the whole book, letter for letter, word for word. So Allah has not allowed, never allowed and never will allow any crookedness to the text of the Quran to happen. He also that promise, no crookedness, covers, it's general, doesn't say no, no crookedness only in the writing or in the text, covers the meaning. The meanings of the Quran cannot be twisted in a way that can stand the test of logic. There are people who give you meanings of the Qur'an that contradict each other or contradict the logical meaning. But the Qur'an itself is written in such a way that if someone falls around and wants to introduce a meaning that is not supported, the text itself would give us evidence 
that that interpretation, that meaning is wrong. It will contradict it. The usage of language in the Quran is perfect. There is no other text on earth that is perfect like that. Hadith are uh, pieces of text, some of which are not reported literally. We should be careful not to look at hadith in a, in a scornful way or say that it is not important. Of course it is important and it, it's always based on the Quran. And if we don't understand how the hadith is related to the Quran, then we have not understood the Quran. So those who say hadith is not important or hadith is, uh, you know, I can do with it what I want. First, let them understand the Quran, and then if they do understand the Quran, every hadith that is authentic, they will find its basis in the Quran, and they will not be able to doubt it because the Quran said it first. The Quran expressed what's in the hadith first. No crookedness in the Qur'an's meanings, no crookedness in the Qur'an's text can ever happen. There are three types of text in the Qur'an. One is called muhkam. And let's go to where that definition is done and... Uh, Maybe do a little grammar there. That's verse 7 of Surah 3, Al-Imran. Verse 7. هُوَ الَّذِي أَنزَلَ عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابِ مِنْهُ آيَاتٌ مُحْكَمَاتٌ هُنَّ أُمُّ الْكِتَابِ وَأُخَرُ مُتَشَابِهَاتٌ He's the one who sent down upon you the book, Anzala alayka al-kitab, huwa al it is he who is the one. This is a jumla ismiya, this is, huwa is a subject, and al is a predicate, is a khabar. Huwa is mubtada, and al is khabar. He is the one. What did this one do? He anzala alayka. He sent down upon you. al kitaba We have just seen the grammar of anzala ala abdi al-kitab. The same expression. Minhu, now we have the start of a new sentence, which is related to the first sentence. Minhu, some of it, ayatum muhkamat. Ayat is the plural of ayah, and it is a noun in the nominative state, which is what uh, subject and predicate are. Al-Qamaru Jamilun. Al-Qamaru is in the nominative. You have Dhamma on the nominative. Or two Dhammas. Tanween the Dham. Ayatun. It's a plural, but it still has that Dham at the end. This nominative sentence starts with a preposition. So the, the subject is implied. The book is such that some of it are verses. What is implied is the book. 
when we say minhu, we're implying the book is such that some of it. Ayatun. Some of the verses. Ayat is the plural of ayah. Ayah means a signal, a sign, a pointer to the truth. The verses of the Quran are all pointers to the truth. They're supposed to be studied, and we're supposed to use them as indicators as to how we act, how we know things, how we understand things. That's why they are called ayat, pointers. When we say verses, we are kind of misleading ourselves. They're not verses of poetry. They're, they're really pointers, signposts on our path. So some of it are ayatun and then muhkamatun. Muhkamatun is an adjective, a sifa, a na'at, an attribute of ayatun. And it follows ayatun in its grammatical case. Muhkamatun. The female form aya, ayatun, the plural of it is ayatun. And the adjective is muhkamatun. The plural is muhkamatun. This is a female plural. Muhkam, muhkamat, muhkam means tied up very firmly. When you tie up, it's mentioned in the, in the Quran, the tying up of prisoners of war. the tying up of things. Ahkama means to fasten and tie up real well. What is tied up with those verses? It's their meaning. Their meaning is tied up. And since nothing is mentioned as to how it is tied up, it is understood that the Quran itself the text itself, the context, the text in which those verses are used, the text in which those ayat are used, the words in those ayat themselves and the words around them and the words in the ayat that are related to them, that is what ties down the meaning firmly, that there is no budging. Now, there will be flexibility in the meaning because some of the meanings are general principles. And in the general principle, you have flexibility. Like feed the poor doesn't limit it to one poor person. And it gives us some flexibility as how to define poor. But feed the poor doesn't mean feed the rich. It doesn't mean... Um, give them only a certain food, there is, there is a clear meaning, but there is flexibility. And Allah wants us to have flexibility because we're supposed to use our senses. We are not literal. We are not robots. Hunna ummul kitab. Those verses, those ayat, whose meaning is tied up, are the mother of the book. Another sentence that is related to the second sentence. Minhu ayatun muhkamatun. Hunna ummul kitab. Hunna ummul kitab is a nominal sentence, jumla ismiya, that starts with hunna, which is the subject, and ummul kitab is a, the predicate. Hunna is mubtada, ummul kitab is predicate is itself, this sentence, is an adjective for muhkamat, for ayat muhkamat. So it's like a second, pre, uh, second predicate or an adjective of ayat muhkamat. They are hunna. Hunna is a plural, female plural pronoun. 
and it refers to the ayat. Ummul Kitab does not mean the mother of the book. Now it is translated the mother of the book, but Um, Um in Arabic has many meanings. In this case, Um means the bulk, the basis, the majority. So these verses are the majority of the Quran. And then there are a few others. Ukhar means others. Now this is a continuation of the first sentence. Minhu ayat, mut muhkamat, wa ukhar. It's also related to minhu. Wa ukharu mutashabihat. Mutashabihat means that their meaning is only indicated in such a way that we think it is similar. There is similarity. Shaba is similarity. But that similarity is false. In verse 25 of the Quran, we have the first usage of that. Verse 25 of, of Surah 2, we have the first... Uh, definition of mutashabi uh, where mut wa utu bihi mutashabiha in verse 25 of surah al-baqarah surah 2 they were brought they were offered fruits that look similar and the word is mutashabihan the same word mutashabihat mutashabihan mutashabihat is the plural of mutashabihatun mutashabihan is a male uh, singular, mutashabi. What is meant there is the things they were given, the fruits they were given, only looked similar. In that verse, it's clear that the similarity is false because Allah is telling us very clearly that the fruits of paradise only look similar. They don't taste the same. They don't give you stomach ache. They don't give you diarrhea. They are not the same. They only look the same. So back to the verse here. A few verses in the Quran. Ukhar is a plural that does not express a lot. It expresses a few. Ukhar is a plural of akhar, other. It's a plural of others. Other, it's like others and a few others. Wa ukhar means a few others. So the bulk of the book, the majority of the Quran, are very well tied in their meanings. And others where the meaning is not offered, we are only given some similarity, some false similarity, just like the false similarity. Mutashabih means falsely similar. To the fruits of the earth. In those verses, there's false similarity to things we know. Allah just doesn't want to give us the meaning of those things. Why? Because they have to do, say, with things that Allah wants to protect from our mischief, like a ruh, the spirit, or they have to do with secrets that Allah keeps in order to protect what is good on earth or secrets of Allah which we are ordered to believe in but will not be revealed until later or never revealed. So Allah talks about those things in words that we are not supposed to understand. We get a false similarity. Now there is a third kind of verses which is a, a subgroup of the uh, the muhkamat. Now here we we un, we see that the muhkamat are the bulk, the um, of the book, and there are only a few that are not clear, that are not, that are we only have false similarity in their expressions. But the muhkamat include for sure, amthal, 
Methel is a similitude. The Amthal are symbolic expressions. Amthal usually start with um, the word Methel itself. Methel al-lazina the similitude of those who were given to bear the Torah and they did not bear it. The, the Imam Khalil likes to cite that from Surah Al-Jumar. Al is like the similitude of a donkey that is carrying books. So we are told explicitly that it's a method. What people do wrong, and Sufis, especially Sufis, do a lot of this. I'm not a Sufi. I, I condone some of the things Sufis do, but I don't condone everything Sufis do. Some of the teachers of Imam Muhammad, Rahmatullahi Ali, Imam W.D. Muhammad had a, a Sufi inclination. They came from Pakistan or India. Uh, that includes the one who suggested to him that he should not be Wallace Dean but Warris Dean. <laughs> they, they believe in symbolic explanation of everything. And the Imam has done a symbolic explanation and interpretation of a lot of things. Um, and it's, it's all right to expand in explaining something to generalize the explanation. But we have to be careful. Some of the mystics, I'm not saying the Imam did this, but some of the mystics of um, the Sufis of Pakistan and India one famous one called Iqbal is a famous scholar who died long ago. Iqbal believed that paradise and the hellfire are just symbolisms. That they're not, there's not a real fire. And this is completely uncalled for. And there's nothing in the Quran that indicates that there is no real burning there is no real paradise. Uh, so you can overdo it in interpretation. The similitude is usually introduced with methyl. The word methyl would be there. Or you would find the preposition ka, which means like. Or something like that. Similarity is indicated. Or it, the whole thing looks like a story that is, I mean, stories are supposed to be lessons. So to interpret a story about, let's say, the brothers of Yusuf conspiring and doing this, that's a story that is supposed to be a lesson for us. So we can interpret around the story how we would benefit from that story in this time or what is the meaning of that behavior in the story? Does it set an example for bad behavior of others or good behavior of others? But when Allah says, those who do this, I will burn them in the hellfire, for God's sake, what do we have to interpret that? Why do we have to interpret that? Except to be uh, rude uh, to Allah, and just like uh, shaitan was rude. We have to be careful. The Quran is not a book of symbolisms. The Quran is a book of information about what will happen to us after we die. And uh, so, uh, just a, a warning that we have to be careful what we interpret away. I, I used to um, have a friend who was an, a Christian pastor in he was honest, and um, we found it together, a, 
an interfaith institute in Eugene, Oregon. And, and he used to say, when I asked him a question, to mom, I <laughs> don't ask me. I would interpret everything away. And besides, I would try to convert you anyway. I can't, I can't let go of that. We Christians, we always are trying to convert someone. So I will try to convert you, and I will interpret it away. Don't ask me about these things. If you want someone to interpret the scripture and give you some meaning of it, I was like I was asking about um, Ishmael in, in, uh, in Genesis. He says, don't ask me. I would interpret everything away. So modern New Age uh, Christians and you might call Sufis New Age Muslims, some of the Sufis, they like to interpret everything away and they would like to feel that everybody's good and everything is hunky-dory and we just need to hug, group hug, and we'll go to paradise. But that's not how Allah sees the world and that's not how we're supposed to look at the world. I think this is a good place to stop and uh, we'll continue later. I hope that was useful. صلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين الفاتحة بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين. Well, if you're still recording, I have a few verses, a few hadiths here. Are you still recording, brother? Yes? Okay. I was asked about these hadiths. I will just say the hadiths in Arabic and translate them. These are all about Arabs and Arabic. عن أبي هريرة والذي نفسي بيده ما أنزل الله عز وجل وحيا قط على نبي من الأنبياء إلا بالعربية ثم يكون ذلك النبي بعد يبلغه قومه بلسانهم This is in Tabarani in Awsat So that's the collection in which this authentic hadith was reported from Abu Huraira I swear by the one in whose soul in whose hand my soul is Allah has not sent Allah the powerful, the majestic, has never sent any revelation to any prophet of the prophets except in Arabic. And then after that, the prophet would deliver it, meaning would translate it to his people in their language. An Ibn Abbas, ahibbu al-Arab li-thalath, li-anni Arabi, wal-Qur'anu Arabi, wa kalamu ahli al-Jannati Arabi. This is reported by Al-Hakim, and also by Al-Tabarani in two collections, Al-Kabir and Al-Awsat. Ibn Abbas reported from the Prophet ﷺ that he said, Love the Arabs for three reasons. Because I am an Arab and the Quran is Arabic and the language, the speech of the people of Jannah, of Paradise, is Arabic. Uh, this is another hadith from Al-Hakim, uh, narrated from Ibn Umar, من أحسن منكم أن يتكلم بالعربية فلا يتكلم بالفارسية فإنه يورث النفاق. Whoever of you is able to speak Arabic should not speak Persian. This is obviously he's talking to Persians to who entered Islam. So if you wonder why many nations have uh, why those who speak Arabic have expanded and why many nations have integrated so much Arabic in their language or prefer to speak Arabic. Uh, the, uh, the Prophet وسلم, has recommended to Persians that they should speak Arabic if they could. If they couldn't, they can continue to speak Persian. Why? He said, because it causes you to become hypocrites. It's like if you can do something in Arabic, don't stay away from Arabic. Because if you can come closer to the Quran by mastering Arabic and, and using Arabic, and you still prefer a different language, 
to speak and deal with the Quran in, then that is akin or, or uh, related or would, would cause you to become a hypocrite. You're supposed to be close to the, to the Quran as close as possible. And if you can speak Arabic and deal with the Arabic of the Quran that way. But this, uh, this thing about Persia has certainly has to do with the fact that the Jal, the Antichrist, the leader of the hypocrites, has headquarters in Persia. So this instruction is specific for Persians, maybe. Um, people are, are not uh, told to abandon their language. So this might be another uh, hadith about Arabs. Is um, from Anas, and it's reported by Al Hakim. Loving Arabs is iman, is faith, and hating them is kufr. Whoever loves Arabs, he has loved me, and whoever hates Arabs, he has hated me. Or whoever loves Arab, that means he loves me, and whoever hates Arabs, he hates me. Arabs have done so much mischief over the hundreds of years since the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This doesn't mean that, but when you, when you become racist and when you hate Arabs, you certainly include the Prophet ﷺ, and hatred for the Arabic language is the same thing. The Quran is in Arabic, and Arabic is not the language of the Arabs. It's a language that Allah has created. They didn't create it, and they have no claim to it and no pride in it, except to be proud of what Allah has given them. So, حب العرب إيمان وبغضهم كفر من أحب العرب فقد أحبني ومن أبغض العرب فقد أبغضني الحاكم I just translated that and then uh, the last hadith is from Tirmidhi إن الله اصطفى من ولد إبراهيم إسماعيل واصطفى من بني إسماعيل بني كنانة واصطفى من بني كنانة قريشا واصطفى من بني قريش بني هاشم وَاسْطَفَانِي مِنْ بَنِي هَاشِمْ Allah has selected from the children of Ibrahim Ishmael, Ismail and from the children of Ismail he, he chose the children of Kinana Kinana is one of the fathers of the, of the Arabs one of the children of uh, Ismail or grandchildren and from Kinana he picked Quraysh Quraysh is also the name of a man the first name of a man and from Quraysh, from the children of Quraysh, he, he picked the children of Hashem. Hashem is another man who is from the children or offspring of Quraysh. And he picked me, he selected me from the children of Hashem. So Allah has chosen the best of humanity. <laughs>